Good day, and welcome to Finnegan's webcast, Food for Thought, Trademark and Advertising Trends in the Food and Beverage Industry. We are excited to discuss with you today recent U.S. and European cases and developments in the food and beverage space, including registrability of traditional and non-traditional trademarks, trademark infringement and dilution claims, and false advertising cases. I'm Laura Johnson, and I'll be your moderator today. It's my pleasure to welcome my co-presenters, Danny Audi, who's a partner in our Washington, D.C. office and the leader of Finnegan's Trademark Group, and Claire Cornell, a partner in our London office and a European trademark attorney. Before I turn things over to our presenters, I invite everyone to participate today by submitting questions. This is an interactive webinar. Just click on the red Q&A button at the lower center of the webcast interface and type your question into the Q&A window, then click Submit. Some of the questions will be answered today during the Q&A session at the end, which will take place um, once Danny and Claire are finished with their presentation. If your question is not answered, we will attempt to follow up after the webinar and cover any questions that you have. You may enlarge the slide window at any time by clicking on the green Enlarge button on the top right of the slide window. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow webcast help guide button in the lower center of the webcast interface. And now I'll turn it over to Danny and Claire to begin your presentation. Welcome, Danny and Claire. The floor is yours. Well, Laura, thank you for that uh, kind introduction, and thank you all um, for joining us today. I see we have um, uh, folks from all over the world and various different uh, time zones. Uh, so uh, good evening to some of you, and good morning, and a very good morning to, to some, some of you as well. Uh, my name is Danny Audi. As Laura mentioned, um, I am uh, in our DC office and head our trademark practice. Today, um, we'll start with some recent uh, cases in the United States um, related to infringement claims, and then we'll proceed to registration, certification marks, non-traditional marks, and a false advertising. So you will see that we have an ambitious agenda, and I will do my best um, to keep us on schedule and to answer, to leave time for questions at the end. The first case that um, I wanted to share with the group today is a fairly recent dispute that's come up involving the trademarks um, and advertising surrounding Cheetos and Pedos. For those who are not in the U.S. and may not be so familiar with Cheetos, Cheetos is a brand that uh, most, if not all of us in the U.S., grew up with. They are cheddar cheese-flavored chips or snacks. And um, if you were fortunate enough to have a bag of Cheetos in your lunch bag when you went to school, you could trade it for almost anything. Definitely could trade it up for a Coke or a Twinkie. Um, it was very much the sought-after uh, indulgence in grade school um, and even, even in adulthood. Uh, but as U.S. consumers and really consumers all over the world have become more interested um, in health uh, and selecting healthier options, products like Cheetos have faced competition from uh, snacks and chips that are, you know, baked or made with uh, non-GMO ingredients or that are otherwise uh, presented as a healthier alternative. And in this particular case, a brand um, came on this year dubbed Pedos. Pedos are um, chips that are made from peas, chickpeas, dry beans, and lentils. So one central feature of Pito's advertising is the healthier ingredients that you would find in their snacks relative to some others, and in particular, relative to Cheetos. As you can see from their uh, website at excerpts here, they are going head-to-head -head with Cheetos and comparing 
the health uh, benefits or uh, what they've alleged are the health benefits of their products relative to Cheetos chips, which they claim are made of um, corn and potatoes and other things that uh, arguably are not as healthy as peas, chickpeas, dried beans, and lentils. I have not done a taste test of these two products. It would be hard to surpass the taste of Cheetos, um, but uh, Pito's has uh, some healthier ingredients um, in its products. But you'll see that not only has Pito's adopted um, you know, a name ending in TOS, they've also gone with a, a similar mascot. The Cheetos has the famous Chester Cheetah um, mascot for its brand, and Chester Cheetah has been advertised heavily in the United States. There was a time where it was one of the most popular Super Bowl ads, and um, Chester Cheetah is all over television here. Pedos selected a uh, tiger mascot, so another feline, and they've adopted the slogan, a new cat on the block, Tigers live longer than cheetahs. So this has gotten under the skin um, of cheetos and uh, a cease and desist letter was sent to the folks at Pitos claiming trademark infringement, um, infringement of, uh, excuse me, trademark infringement, trademark dilution, and false advertising uh, relative to the claim, tigers live longer than cheetahs. Um, the allegation is that making such a claim conveys that the pedos chips or snacks are a healthier alternative and that consumers who eat pedos will live longer than those that eat cheetos. Uh, this case is, is still uh, very much uh, in, the, in the mix, and we're waiting to see how PepsiCo proceeds. The Cheetos trademark has been um, approved for registration um, at the, excuse me, the Pedos trademark has been approved for registration at the USPTO. Um, no opposition was filed by uh, PepsiCo. I suspect this will be uh, a case that they slug out in the courts. With that, I will turn it over to Claire for um, recent developments um, on the EU side. Although there isn't an infringement case in particular to talk about today, one well-documented uh, spat between a couple of brand owners did spring to mind and seems relevant to discuss today. Now, this is a dispute between Mondelez, who are the proprietor of the iconic Toblerone chocolate bar, and the discount food product company Poundland. At Christmas time last year, Poundland launched their own product called the Twin Peaks Bar. The Twin Peaks Bar looked rather similar to the traditional shaped Toblerone bar, although it had a Twin Peaks style shape rather than a pointed single peak. Um, this was actually a case that settled out of court, but at, um, at the time that the products were launched, there was some indication that Mondelez would be seeking to take a trademark infringement action against Townland. Now, one of the factors that influenced this case was the decision to alter the shape of the Toblerone bar, in the UK at least. I'm not sure whether that was also happening outside of the UK, to make the bar significantly smaller with fewer peak-shaped pieces of chocolate. Um, Poundland thought they might be able to take advantage of this and suggested that they could try and cancel the registration of the shape mark owned by Mondelez on the basis that it wasn't going to be used anymore. Um, it's worth noting that actually a challenge like that wouldn't have been successful until five years after registration when a non-use action can be filed. Nonetheless, the companies did reach a settlement 
position. And I've read in the media over the last couple of weeks that a new Twin Peaks bar has been launched for this upcoming Christmas season by Poundland. Um, the shape of the chocolate bar is now somewhat different with an appearance of peaks and hills um, which don't look so much like the traditional pointed Toblerone style bar. I've also read that the packaging has been changed from that iconic golden color to a blue and gold combination. It's also interesting to read that the shape of the Toblerone bar should be changing back to the one that we know and love, possibly simply for the purposes of maintaining their tra trademark registration and not risking a non-use cancellation. On that note, I'll hand you back to Danny, who's going to talk about some registration issues. Thanks, Claire. Um, so the case that we've got uh, queued up is a decision that's come down from the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals this month involving the registration of the trademark corn thins and rice thins, and in particular, um, the issue is whether thins uh, can be registered. That is, is it distinctive um, either inherently or has the term acquired distinctiveness such that it could be registered in the U.S.? This descriptive, merely descriptive words in the U.S. are not inherently registrable but can become registrable upon a showing of acquired distinctiveness. So in this particular dis dispute, Real Foods applied to register corn thins and rice thins for its um, crisp bread slices made of corn and rice. And in the course of seeking registration, Real Foods disclaimed the word corn and rice, but not thins, taking the position that um, thins is distinctive and that corn thins and rice thins taken in their entireties um, is also distinctive. And one argument that they've raised in uh, defending the distinctiveness of the mark is that there is a double entendre, meaning there is a dual, dual message sent by corn thins, in particular the word thins. Uh, and what they've contended is that the word thins conveys a low-calorie, light, and diet-friendly characteristic of the product. And so uh, there is a double entendre in the meaning of corn thins and rice thins. The issue first went to the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, and the board rejected that contention that there is a double entendre and or that there is a distinctive meaning behind the word um, thins. Uh, the two issues that were raised before the board are whether thins is descriptive, and also whether it's generic. Frito-Lay brought this case because they um, have the product name Wheat Thins, and uh, there are some other thin formative trademarks for similar products owned by Frito-Lay and others. And Frito-Lay's position has been if uh, Real Foods registered corn thins, um, and is found to own rights in thins alone, that could uh, provide a competitive or would impose, I should say, a competitive disadvantage to Frito-Lay and others who use thins in their product trademarks. So the board took up the issue of whether thins is generic, whether it's descriptive. Um, in terms of generic, the board found thins is not a generic designation. Uh, but sustained the descriptiveness of the word thins. The case went up to the Federal Circuit, which hears appeals from the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board in the U.S., um, and the Federal Circuit looked at the issue and uh, looked at the evidence that was presented to show acquired distinctiveness in thins. And when they looked at that at evidence, and in the U.S., Sales volume, advertising expenditure, and length of use are um, some core factors that are considered when deciding if a designation has acquired distinctiveness. 
the Federal Circuit looked at the advertising that had gone into the marks and determined that there really wasn't um, enough advertising in proportion to the marks um, for that factor to weigh in favor of finding acquired distinctiveness. There also have been some survey evidence that had been submitted in the case that indicated the consumers had a low uh, preference for real foods, corn, rice, cakes, relative to alternatives on the market. Um, the Federal Circuit also looked at the length of use of the mark, and although there can be uh, certain presumptions drawn from five years of continuous use uh, in the United States, it is not a binding, uh, it's not binding for purposes of acquired distinctiveness. So the Federal Circuit concluded that, you know, it's something that we can account for in deciding acquired distinctiveness, but it's not binding on the decision. In this instance, we think that particularly where you have a highly descriptive term like thins, uh, the length of use, uh, where these other factors are um, not in support of acquired distinctiveness, it doesn't control the the, uh, the analysis. There was also survey evidence to show that only about 10% of respondents in the survey identified corn thins with a single company, meaning, you know, only 10% um, considered corn thins uh, to be a source identifier, and then only roughly half of those um, identified corn thins as coming from real foods. So that evidence suggested that uh, the mark has not acquired distinctiveness. The Federal Circuit upheld the uh, refusal on descriptiveness grounds. There was also the contention that thins is generic. And the board determined that it wasn't generic, but on appeal before the Federal Circuit, the Federal Circuit uh, ruled that the um, method used by the board to determine whether thins is generic was not correct, that um, the board had examined whether thins is generic for popcorn cakes. In the board's opinion, it should have been uh, considered whether thins is generic for um, all types of crackers. And so the board, the Federal Circuit remanded that issue to the board. So um, in short, uh, thins um, has been determined uh, descriptive terminology. Um, and Real Foods was unable to prove acquired distinctiveness in it. And the question of whether thins would ultimately be decided as generic has now gone back to the board. So we'll stay tuned for ruling on that front in the near future. Um, with that, I hand it back to Claire for um, the EU. So the case that I'm going to talk about briefly relates to a registration of a combina combination of colors in the European Union by Red Bull and the subsequent invalidation of that registration. Uh, as you'll no doubt be aware, it can be difficult to register colors per se as trademarks, generally just because the consumer isn't used to recognizing a color as a trademark. So in order to secure a registration, providing evidence of acquired distinctiveness through use of that mark is required to secure registration. I'm sure you're all familiar with the blue and silver colors on the Red Bull can and the evidence of acquired distinctive character provided during the registration procedure secured Red Bull a registration for the colors blue and silver. However, the issue that was encountered here related not to the distinctiveness of the trademark itself, but the way that the trademark is represented on the register. It's necessary in Europe to provide a description of how the colors will be used. And on my slide, you'll see that the description is somewhat basic in that the colors are provided in a ratio of 50% to 50%, or that they will be applied in equal proportion and juxtaposed to one another. The invalidation claim was made on the basis that the registration wasn't clear, precise, self-contained, easily accessible, intelligible, durable, and objective. These are 
criteria known as the Seekman criteria, which are used to assess the registrability of trademarks and in particular non-traditional marks. Unfortunately for Red Bull, the finding of invalidity was upheld both by the EU IPO and at appeal despite arguing that the description was sufficient to allow a person reviewing the register to understand how the mark would be represented. The finding was that the indication of a ratio of colors didn't constitute a systematic arrangement which would allow customers to repeat a, with certainty a purchasing experience. Now that's somewhat confusing language, but what they meant really was that blue and silver, as per the descriptions provided, could be applied to a product in all sorts of different styles and applications. For example, a chessboard style arrangement of blue and silver would have fallen within that description. So the protection that would be offered by that kind of trademark was simply too broad. It's interesting because this new requirement for apparently a more detailed description of a trademark would appear to make it more difficult to register a combination of colors than a single color on its own where a description of how the color would be applied needn't be as detailed if it's a single color itself. It's also worth noting in the context of non-traditional marks used for foodstuffs that the sequin criteria which were mentioned in this decision also are relevant in relation to taste marks or smell marks which are currently not acceptable at the EU IPO for those reasons that they are not sufficiently clear, precise, self-contained, easily accessible, intelligible, durable and objective. And on that note I pass you back to Danny. Well, I um, have included a case for those who are approaching happy hour uh, in Europe and those who are um, finishing up their dinner in Asia. And the certification mark tequila, and really where does tequila come from is the question before the trademark trial and appeal board in this case. Um, the applicant for the mark tequila is an organization, a nonprofit organization that's accredited under Mexican law to manage conformity of uh, the tequila product, and in particular, to ensure that uh, tequila is, comes from Mexico and that it meets certain specifications um, for manufacture of that uh, beverage in Mexico. So this organization filed to register tequila as a certification mark um, for distilled spirits um, in a, a, for coming from the agave plant in particular. The opposer in this instance is an organization that imports and bottles spirits, and they, um, they, they bottle spirits that um, – would include a, a tequila-like um, ingredient, but that they could not present as tequila because that ingredient did not comply with the mandates under Mexican law. And so uh, this organization claimed that they would be harmed uh, through the inability to brand their product as a tequila if registration was granted to um, the applicant in this case. And so the issue really turns on whether tequila is a generic designation, meaning one that refers to a general category of alcohol, no matter where it, it, it's sourced from, Mexico or another country, or if tequila is a descriptive designation of origin that refers to beverages or alcohol from derived from the agave plant sourced from Mexico only. 
And in looking at this issue, um, the parties presented uh, various pieces of evidence. The um, applicant presented evidence of dictionary definitions for the word tequila, which in the majority um, of definitions, it is defined as coming from Mexico specifically. The applicant also submitted survey evidence to show that um, consumers, uh, a significant number of consumers identify tequila as identifying um, agave uh, sourced or derived alcohol from Mexico. And that survey um, surveyed 502 participants and um, asked them, you know, when they uh, see an alcoholic beverage as identified as tequila, do they in fact think it is coming from a particular source? And is that source Mexico? Of those who responded, 62.9% identified tequila as identifying alcohol from Mexico in particular. On the other hand, the opposer presented evidence in the form of um, surveys to show that, you know, purchasers um, don't identify tequila as uh, indicating the geographic origin of the product. The survey that the opposer submitted, though, was thrown out by the board um, based on the universe that was uh, surveyed. In particular, the opposer surveyed purchasers of hard liquor in general uh, versus consumers of tequila in particular. And the board said uh, that survey was of very limited value because the universe was just too broad. The uh, applicant had surveyed consumers of tequila, uh, in particular those who had purchased tequila either a month before taking the survey or that intended to purchase the tequila within a month um, of after taking the survey. So the opposer survey was um, essentially thrown out. Uh, the opposer had also submitted evidence to show how these products are advertised and um, that the source or the origin of the product is rarely central to the advertisements. You often see these ads of you know happy people at the bar or at a party. Um, and, and, and rarely is it called out that these products come from Mexico. The uh, opposer also presented evidence to show that, or really tried to show that consumers really didn't care so much where the product comes from. They uh, were more concerned with how it tastes, um, the price point, et cetera. And they um, had also gone to liquor stores and um, photographed how the product is categorized within those stores. Um, they presented evidence to, to attempt to show that tequila was just a general designation or category of um, distilled alcohol and not a designation um, that was identified as uh, alcohol coming from Mexico in particular. That evidence fell short um, because many of those liquor stores were also um, using scotch to identify uh, whiskey coming from Scotland, um, and the, designa the general designation tequila, in fact, was showing products coming from Mexico in particular. So the evidence that the opposer mustered up at the end of the day was considered insufficient to show that tequila was a generic designation. Um, the board ultimately ruled that tequila is a descriptive designation identifying agave-derived alcohol from Mexico, and the applicant was also able to show, for purposes of seeking or obtaining registration as a certification mark, that it does, in fact, control um, how the tequila certification is applied, meaning uh, they are responsible for um, picking up applications for those who want to apply the word tequila to their uh, alcohol, um, and they are responsible and have the authority through the Mexican law to do so. Um, so they were able to show that uh, not only is tequila uh, descriptive of products coming from Mexico, but they have the authority to and, in fact, do 
um, control uh, the products that qualify for it, uh, receiving that certification mark. So when you all order tequila at happy hour shortly, um, make sure it is from uh, Mexico as certified and enjoy. And with that, um, back to Claire. Unfortunately, I don't have anything exciting to talk about like tequila, but I do present an overview of protection for geographic names and other indications in Europe. My first slide discusses briefly the certification and collective marks which are available under EU law and how they interface with geographical names. Um, at the EU IPO, being able to register certification marks is actually only a very recent thing, so there aren't many examples at this point in time. However, it's worth noting that these marks were available in the UK and have been for some time. Um, in the UK, geographical names can be accepted as certification trademarks if it's considered that the name is capable of distinguishing certified from uncertified goods and services. But the guidelines set out by the European Intellectual Property Office have stated that geographical names cannot be protected as certification marks. Nonetheless, they are protectable as collective marks if they are capable of distinguishing the goods and services of the members of an association, unless, of course, the association comprises only a minority of the people entitled to use that indication. At this point in time, in relation to food and beverage related products, a couple of certification marks have been granted which relate to applying signs to kosher foods. And these have been secured by the Federation of Synagogues and the Union of Orthodox Jewish Congregations of America with collective marks and certification marks, it is necessary to file your application, including a set of regulations about how the trademark will be used and how the proprietor of the mark will monitor that use in order to ensure that it falls within the necessary parameters that have been set out. Where certification marks are concerned, the trademark proprietor is only responsible for assessing the qualities of the product, whereas for collective marks, although it's normal that the association owning the trademark doesn't use that mark, they are not precluded from doing so. In Europe, as well as trademark protection through the trademark register, the European regulations also offer special indicators which effectively afford specific protection to geographical indications, designations of origin and traditional speciality guaranteed. These types of protection are governed at EU level. The geographical indication will protect the name of an area, a place, or a name of a country where a particular product is at least partially manufactured within that specific region. A designation of origin affords the same protection when the product is entirely manufactured within that region. Provided that you have protection, you're able to apply the EU logos to your product to show that the product you are making fulfills the necessary criteria. My next slide shows a selection of protected designations of origin and geographical indications originating from the UK. And those of you who are thinking about Brexit at the moment may have questions about how that protection will be applied once the UK leaves the EU. At the moment, there are 86 protected indications originating from the UK. 
And in September this year, the UK Intellectual Property Office, in anticipation of a possible no-deal Brexit, published a paper setting out how these indications would be protected if a no-deal scenario involves the UK leaving the EU at the end of March. What they have stated is that if you have a UK originating indication, which is currently on the EU register, the UK will be setting up their own equivalent register and move these products onto it automatically. It suggests at this time that if you have protection at the, in the EU, which originates from another country, that you may need to reapply at the UK office. The UK has also suggested that they will be providing a new logo to be applied to food that has been recognized as having a designation of origin or geographical indication, which is recognized in the UK. I now hand you back to Danny. So our next topic uh, considers non-traditional trademarks, and this is a fun area in the food and beverage space in particular, uh, because I think you know consumers for these products, uh, you know, tend to gravitate towards the look and feel of packaging um, and product design, maybe more so than in other industries. You know, when we stroll through the supermarket um, shelves, a lot of us, you know. We could pick out the Cheerios box just based on the color, even if the word wasn't there, or you know, think of your favorite products that you could identify readily simply based on the appearance of the package or the product itself. In the United States, protection is afforded to product packaging and product design through trade dress and also through um, design patents and uh, copyrights as well. I will focus on trade dress for today's purposes. Trade dress for product packaging under U.S. law is something that it can be inherently um, registrable, meaning you could register it without a showing of acquired distinctiveness. Product designs, on the other hand, require a showing of acquired distinctiveness uh, in order to obtain trade dress registration. And as I was mentioning uh, earlier, some of those factors relevant to acquired distinctiveness are length of use, extent of your advertising, um, extent of your sales, how the product and the features that you're claiming trade dress in are advertised, meaning are you showcasing those elements, are you calling those elements out, have consumers come to recognize those elements in particular um, as source identifiers, is there any functional aspects to those elements. Um, and so you'll see some examples pulled from U.S. registrations before you now of trade dress um, that's issued uh, as well as some packaging designs. Now, there is one particular trade dress here that is the subject of, at least according to the owner and the submissions filed with the trademark office, subject of 1 billion uh, consumer impressions, 200, over 200 million in sales, and 80 million roughly in advertising. And that is not the Starbucks product. So for those who are um, looking uh, over the slide now, I challenge you to identify the product I described. And as I move to the next slide, you will see what those products are. The product that I was describing is the Sargento packaging that you see uh, in the lower, uh, in the middle of the lower portion of the slide. That uh, evidence submitted in connection with registering that mark showed over a billion consumer impressions. Uh, the Butterball, which is um, shown to the right of the Starbucks, it's been the subject of over 20 years of use and $23 million. Um, <clears throat> in sales and many, many millions in advertising. Um, the advantages of trade dress registration in the U.S. relative to design patents or even copyright protection that might apply to the packaging, trade dress uh, protection uh, akin to the protection of traditional word marks can last in perpetuity, meaning that protection will last as long as the product is uh, used or the packaging is used and as you can see from 
the history of many food products, whether it's the Starbucks packaging or, you know, the, the, the look and feel of the Coca-Cola bottle, um, there are you know, many products that stand the test of time, um, and the, the protection that would um, extend through the life of those product li life cycles over the decades would really be trade dress because your design patent would have long expired um, and your copyright rights may not extend to how that product looks or the particular uh, packaging design associated with it. So trade dress provides considerable advantages uh, for brand owners in the U.S. and uh, in particular in the food and beverage category, um, it can be a very uh, meaningful way to distinguish and protect um, your distinctive product design from your competitors. Um, with that, over to Claire. In Europe, the protection of the shape of goods and their packaging is something that is recognized under trademark law. The slide I'm showing here gives some examples of non-traditional trademarks, which are actually all three-dimensional trademarks that have been registered in Europe for various types of products. It's worth noting when filing applications for 3D trademarks in particular that it's possible to have up to six perspective views of the product when you're applying to register. However, where a product can be opened or closed, for example, a box or a bottle with a lid, it's necessary that the series of representations all show that product in the same format. This slide just shows some of those products in use. It can be difficult to register shape trademarks, and one that you may be aware of was the unfortunate case with the Lint chocolate bunny, where although the appearance and the packaging of this particular bunny is quite well known in the UK at least, it was found that it didn't have sufficient distinctive character for registration across the EU. In order to register three-dimensional trademarks, the EU has provided some useful guidance about what is registrable and what may be registrable if it has acquired distinctiveness. Shapes which are unrelated to the goods themselves are normally distinctive, whereas shapes that consist of the shapes of the goods, them goods themselves or parts of the goods or shapes which are related to the goods or services they may not be distinctive and their distinctiveness must be assessed. It is necessary to consider whether or not the shape of the goods or the packaging is materially different from basic common or expected shapes. In most cases, it's necessary to prove evidence of acquired distinctiveness. Much the same involve, is involved for the shape of packaging where for inherent registrability, it must be striking or different from those common in the marketplace. Overcoming distinctiveness objections in the European Union can be quite difficult. And this slide errs on the side of caution to some extent because the guidance from the EU, which suggests that distinctiveness must be proven throughout the entire European Union is a very high hurdle for applicants to meet. The EU IPO has suggested in some cases that where non-traditional marks are concerned, it may be possible to extrapolate market behavior in parts of the European Union where the market is somewhat homogenous. Case law does suggest, however, that whilst having two missing European countries from your evidence of acquired distinctiveness might be sufficient to prove overall that the mark is sufficiently distinctive for registration, Cases to date suggest that if you have as many as four countries from the European Union missing, the mark will probably not be found to have sufficient distinctive character. 
When providing evidence of acquired distinctiveness, it's necessary to show that a significant proportion of the relevant public identify the goods or services as originating for a partic from a particular undertaking. And examples of the evidence that you might be required to show include the market share for the product, the intensity of use of the mark, that is to say the volume of products sold, where they've been sold to, the geographical extent of use. It can also include the investment spent on promoting that trademark to the public. And it must also show that a significant proportion of the relevant public rely on that shape to indicate origin. This reliance has been discussed in cases in the UK recently. That is to say, if your product is a particular shape but is always packaged in different packaging, you may not be able to meet that reliance necessity to show that a shape itself is an indication of origin. I would just clarify in case it wasn't clear there that this relates to shape marks or reliance, not necessarily the appearance of packaging where the um, proportion of the relevant public should be using that to identify the origin of the product. And on that note, I head back to Danny. Well, I will do uh, my best to cover this last topic quickly as we're running short on time and I want to leave um, some room for questioning. But the false advertising um, issues that uh, I'll discuss briefly in the next slides is one that really come front and center for many industries in the United States and in particular the food and beverage space has now been the subject of several um, false advertising um, cases brought in the form of class actions and otherwise. The first case that uh, I'll address is, and, and so in preparing for today's presentation, I should say that I did uh, Google the correct pronunciation of this brand, um, and it seems to be still a debate. Um, and there are a lot of funny YouTube uh, videos about how it should be pronounced. And I will go with the majority opinion from YouTubers, which is uh, LaCroix. So if, if that is uh, offensive or wrong to anyone, uh, please email me later. But um, LaCroix uh, sparkling water has been challenged because the brand um, advertises these products as all natural um, and 100% natural. Uh, a purported class action was filed against uh, the brand on the basis that these drinks contain synthetically created compounds added to the product that are not naturally occurring. Synth they are synthetically created. Um, and some of these compounds, um, at least the plaintiffs in this purported class action allege, can, it can result in kidney toxicity. Uh, some of these compounds allegedly are used for cockroach insecticides and others for cancer treatment. Um, and so the, the claims have come under various um, state um, and other false advertising and consumer protection acts um, against how the product is, is promoted as all natural. Now the designation natural uh, is still open for uh, interpretation. Uh, the Food and Drug um, Association Administration has taken up the question, what is natural? How should it be defined? If a product contains something that's GMO uh, modified, can it be natural? If the animals were fed something that's GMO modified, can those products be uh, considered natural? And the FDA has not come back with guidance on what natural means or how it should be construed in this context. This has um, caused angst for food and beverage um, providers and also the courts who are looking for guidance. And in fact, some courts have punted on the issue of, this, of deciding what natural means pending um, FDA-issued uh, guidance. And so whether the LaCroix uh, beverage is all natural or not uh, will be decided 
by the courts, perhaps with FDA guidance, depending on when that comes down or not. Uh, but the use of this categorization, all natural and natural, is um, a, a risky proposition for uh, those in the food and beverage space because it remains an open question. And um, as we've seen from this case and others, uh, you know, the issue certainly has the attention of the plaintiff's bar who's been uh, pursuing these types of cases. So now I really need to hustle given how much time we have left. Uh, another false advertising uh, case of recent note was brought against um, Chipotle involving um, GMO and use of GMO um, in connection with their advertising. You know, Chipotle was among the first to come out and say, you know, look, we're not going to use GMO um, ingredients in our products. And they had a very significant advertising campaign, uh, GMO over it was the name of the campaign. And they went so far as to even uh, remove the letters G, M, and O from uh, some of their menus in their stores. So when you, you know, review uh, you know, the, the list of items you could order, you would notice, wait a minute, there are letters missing. And that was in part um, through the removal of the letters GMO to convey to consumers that they are taking this healthier approach to food ingredients. But their approach has been challenged in the form of a class action lawsuit uh, that has been certified. Uh, and the claims against Chipotle are, some of them anyway, are summarized here. And in essence, the challenge has been that you know, some of the products, some of the meat products, come from animals that are fed uh, GMO uh, feed. Um, there are items in Chipotle's restaurants, um, you know, beverages that contain GMO uh, ingredients. Uh, and so th the allegations are that, you know, um, Chipotle can't uh, promote itself as GMO free because uh, the products either are coming from animals that are, eat uh, GMO modified food or otherwise. There is a debate uh, in this um, lawsuit as to, you know, what is the damage uh, from someone who purchases a Chipotle burrito thinking it was uh, coming from, that's not GMO. Uh, the Chipotle contends that there was no differential in price between GMO and non-GMO, et cetera. So there will be a fight over damages as this case moves forward, but it has been certified as a class. Um, and just goes to show another example of how the food and beverage space is facing these um, challenges relative to advertising. The final case I wanted to discuss, and I'll do it very briefly, uh, deals with advertising in the form of imagery. Um, in this particular instance, the case involved IAM's um, pet food product, and on the uh, label or the packaging of the product, you'll see uh, these various food items um, that are very attractive. A case was brought for false advertising on the notion that uh, the ingredients in these uh, in this particular food product is not um, the ones shown on the cover, but you know other uh, pieces of meat or processed pieces of meat, etc. And the court uh, threw this case out. Uh, and the court ultimately concluded uh, on a motion to dismiss that, uh, you know, re reasonable consumers don't look at this imagery and think that uh, what they're purchasing is, in fact, made from um, these particular cuts of meat. And the court uh, anal analyzed, uh, com compared the case to um, fast food products. When we see these beautiful burgers on uh, the television ads and we go um, through the drive through and, and, and pick up our burger, they usually don't look the same, right? Um, the, 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 what we see in the advertisement is not what a reasonable consumer expects necessarily to receive um, at the drive through window. And the same uh, thought process went into the court's um, ruling on the motion to dismiss in this uh, particular case. So that's um, all I have on the U.S. side. I'll turn it over to Claire um, for the EU. Thank you.
Given that we have a very short amount of time, I will just summarize very briefly the situation related to false advertising with a focus on the UK where I'm based. Here, the Advertising Standards Agency governs what can and cannot be said in advertisements. And the ASA isn't a legal body, but a self-regulated body amongst the advertising industry. Their code effectively says that advertising must be legal, decent, honest, and truthful. When it comes to advertising food products in particular, there have been some companies that have made claims that have been on the wrong side of the truthful line. It is necessary if you're going to make claims regarding a product to be able to provide specific examples to back up any kind of claim. It is possible to apply some disclaimers to adverts to suggest that they might not be as good for you as the claim might be made. For example, Special K Nourish had suggested that they were nutritious, but a disclaimer backing up the advert to say that it was a source of vitamin D and B12 could be enjoyed of a part of a varied and balanced diet and healthy lifestyle was sufficient to overcome that objection. Generally, nutrition claims are also regulated by the European Union who have a set of parameters which set out the descriptions and how exactly your product must meet those. So products that are low fat or fat free or energy reduced must fall within certain guidelines to make sure that the products do meet a European standard. Given the time that we have left, I will hand you back to my moderator, Laura. Great. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Danny. So we, we talked a little bit about non-traditional trademark protections. and. And I know clients offer a variety of different packaging, and it's offered for you know, various periods of time. Um, what would you say are a couple of the key takeaways on what is worth protecting? Well, I'll I'll jump in um, to answer that question. You know, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, some of these product packages uh, stand the test of time, and so. Um, you know, thinking about a trade dress strategy to protect the look and feel of that packaging over decades um, is something that could really benefit brand owners if they, um, you know, are, are deliberate about that and uh, implement that um, strategy sooner than later. Um, so that would include kind of promoting, thinking about how you're going to promote the product packaging itself, um, seeking registration for it, um, and uh, adapting uh, that uh, strategy as the packaging evolves somewhat over time, although keeping the same overall look and feel. I would say that much the same applies in Europe, as well as protecting packaging with registered trademarks. It's also possible to project, protect packaging using registered designs. So both of these can be a option for a proprietor looking to protect the look and feel of their products. The registered design has an advantage at least that there is no substantive examination in Europe and as such a mark which might need to show acquired distinctiveness to qualify as a trademark may be registrable as a design in the interim. Great Clara, that's so helpful. Thank you both. So we, ha we have got a couple of questions in. Um, Claire, they are are both for you. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with uh, Linda's question. Are there any cases within the EU regarding use requirements in connection with 2D and 3D marks uh, when they are missing elements compared to how they are actually used? 
And generally, in terms of providing evidence of use of a product, you need to show that it is not substantially different or give a substantially different overall impression to the mark that's registered. I can't immediately think of any cases illustrating that point, but if I find anything, I'll be sure to send a follow-up email. Great, thank you. And then the second question is asking about uh, the approach to translation of foreign abbreviations, um, i.e. product model names in advertising. That's a good question. I know that in relation to protected titles at least that a translation may still be seen to be an infringement of a registered product designation. For example, if you are using the word Parmesan or Parmigiano, I believe that those would be equivalent. Uh, in terms of the approach to translation of foreign abbreviations in product model names, I suppose on a practical sense, if you want them to be recognized in local markets, that you probably do need to have those translated so they're recognized. But I'm not sure whether this question was in relation to registrability or in terms of an actual legal requirement to do so. So I apologize for that. I think that that draws our, our time to a close. Uh, thank you very much for attending today's webcast, Food for Thought, Trademark and Advertising Trends in the Food and Beverage Industry. Uh, we appreciate it.